Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Good afternoon, MIT alumni, and welcome. Thanks for joining today's Career Lunch and Learn program, Taking Charge of Your Talent. In this MIT Career Lunch and Learn webinar, Don Mariska, a founder and CEO of three Silicon Valley companies and a master certified coach, will share some of his greatest lessons from a second career, enabling leading companies to cultivate success in their organizations. Whether you're considering a career transition to a role that will better amplify your talent or hoping to cultivate and manage more successful teams, you should take much away today uh, to reflect on whether in, in your business or nonprofit government or your startup role. A reminder that we're broadcasting live. Uh, throughout the program, you can submit your questions using the Q&A feature in your Zoom toolbar. If you don't automatically see your toolbar, simply drag your mouse across the edges of your screen until it reappears. Uh, we'll be also using the polling feature on Zoom uh, where you can participate interactively in some questions that our guest has for you. When you see the poll pop up on your screen, simply select your answer or answers and hit submit. For all the listeners joining via YouTube today, you can answer, uh, you can ask your questions or comments uh, in the comments field on the YouTube live screen. And you can also tweet comments or questions using the hashtag MIT Better World. And now to our presenter, uh, Don is the founder and CEO of three Silicon Valley companies, a venture investor, and recipients of the National Innovators Award. He writes from a broad base of experience. Uh, Don's lifelong passions for creativity, translating innovative ideas into practical applications, and bringing out the best in others uh, stimulate his work. And with that, I'll turn things over to Don. Uh, Don, thank you for joining us today. Well, my pleasure, Joe. And it's great to be with the MIT alumni. Uh, my wife and I, uh, my wife is an alum of M MIT, the Sloan program. Uh, we were delighted to meet with Joe and other MIT alums uh, on a trip to Japan this spring. So uh, great to be with you and great to have the opportunity to share some insights with you. My real passion for you and what I want you to get out of this hour is to find ways that you can make greater use of your talent and have fun doing it. Both of those are critically important, not only the use of talent, but also the ways to, to be effective in doing it. So we're gonna take a look at, at what are the steps and approaches that you can do to accomplish that. Uh, the objectives for this session are to stimulate your next chapter in your talent story. I'd like you to think of your talent as a story and that it has chapters to it. And you've had your chapter at MIT that opened up many opportunities for you and probably a number of chapters since. Uh, and the question is, you know, what's the next chapter for you? Are you stuck in a chapter and you want to move forward? Or do you want to expand the chapter, make your story more interesting? Uh, how do you make this more fulfilling for yourself? And to sample three keys uh, to unlock your talent uh, and to help you move forward more effectively and to offer resources you can use to go further. Uh, so that's our uh, set of objectives for today. Uh, what, what I want to do is to find out right here at the start, and Joe, if you'd put up the first polling question, uh, we're interested in knowing where you are in your career. Uh, some of the lessons from today are specific to certain uh, stages in careers and some uh, span all different stages. So Joe, if you would take a moment and, and put up the, um, the slides here on the polling questions, that'll be great. And we'll take a look at where people are and uh, what's important to them at this stage. Okay, so there's the polling question, super. Um, whoops. So we'll give a moment here and, and see what um, happens on the um, polling and, and how we can tune today's session in to serve each of you wherever you are in a most effective way. Apologies to those who voted before I clicked launch. I think some had chimed in. Please do so again. Okay. This is like Chicago voting. You can vote off, uh, uh, often uh, as you wish. Huh? So, so one of the things is that, you know, today's careers are not linear. Uh, they're more like a circle, like an evolution over time. Uh, and I found for myself, there are lots of periods of, of success, lots of periods of regrouping. Uh, I've been in the entrepreneurial space uh, with venture investors. They uh, are uh, folks that, you know, 
are, are excited about when you start and, and also can spin you out when they see the next uh, opportunity coming or, or a situation that's occurring. So there's lots of things that we have to navigate in our careers. So uh, Joe, let's see what uh, turned out in terms of our uh, polling results. Bear with me here, but uh, at the capstone stage, most of the largest amount, but a decent 44% at the mid stage. Yeah, can you display those uh, for us or is uh, that? Where am I? Oh yeah, I'm sorry, share results. Ah, okay. All right, so so big on the on the renewer capstone stage. That's great. Uh, that's essentially where I am in my career, so I can identify with you there, and a lot of you in the mid stage, and a few in early out. Uh, all the things we're talking about today are really going to be applicable to you at any of those stages. So let's let's jump right into how you can uh, go forward and, and be effective. So one of the things that we've learned in doing uh, research on thousands of people in dozens of organizations around the world is that there's a huge bank of untapped talent. Uh, no matter how successful people are, no matter how effectively they're using their talent, when I ask them, you know, is there additional talent that you could be tapping uh, to be even more effective in what you're doing, people will almost universally say yes. And then in fact, it averages out to 30 to 40% of the talent that people have that they feel could be applicable to their career interests ends up being untapped. So there's a huge reservoir here. The, and what we found is that there's a very close correlation between the use of talent and satisfaction. So those people that find ways to use more of their talent also find that they're more personally fulfilled. And so there's, uh, it's not the sort of thing that one trades off against the other, that if you're using more of your talent, you're squeezing out your personal satisfaction and the time to enjoy other things. You're actually opening up and expanding those realms uh, for yourself. Don, and, if I can uh, interrupt, you have, you have slides you want to show there? Uh, I, I was, uh, oh, yes, I was showing the- The, the poll might have shut the off. I showing the slide, or am I not? Okay. Um, so let's see. I'm. I thought that had the control to sl show the slide. Um, oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, there we go. We need to. Uh, here's the PowerPoint slide. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there we go. That should work. Got it. Yep. Um, so uh, we were just talking a moment ago about you know what's the huge level of of untapped talent, 30 to 40% of talent is untapped. And then about the close correlation, here's a team with a, a high tech firm. Uh, and this is their distribution of use of talent and satisfaction. You can see the people who have found ways to use more of their talent up here are also more satisfied. And this is what I've seen over and over, whether it's in the public sector, private sector, uh, or any uh, individual space. So there's lots of opportunity for all of us here and for all of us to find ways to, to be more effective. So let's take a look at what you can do to unlock that talent in yourself and in others. And that's an important feature in all this because what we found in the research and in the experience is that um, we really are can be much more effective in getting uh, things done with and through other people helping us as catalysts to us in uh, developing our talent more effectively. This is far more effective than sitting by yourself and thinking, what am I gonna do with my future? Uh, when you engage with other people in a structured way, and we'll talk with you about what that structure is and give you the tools to use that structure, you're gonna be far more successful. So what happens, however, when we start to think about using more of our talent is a lot of buts get in our way. You know, I could be doing more, but I don't have time. Uh, I'm already overworked and there's no help. I don't have the support I need. Um, we don't have a budget for it. You know, people start thinking about, uh, they just don't have the resources. This isn't gonna work. Uh, so what we're gonna do today is really take a look at how you can uh, get past those buts uh, and, and move forward. Because if we get, remain stuck in those situations, all those justifications we have for why we are where we are in our careers, we become victims of our talent story rather than the hero of that story. We become constrained by all those factors, not to negate them or to say that they aren't real for you or me, but to say, you know, is that how we want our story to be, uh, to be constrained in that way and to have us be locked in a chapter that we can't get out of and move forward in our story? So 
what I want to do is take a moment to share with you some of the neuroscience foundations for the uh, keys that I'm going to be sharing with you in a moment so that you can see why they're important and how they work. And hopefully that'll motivate you to put them into practice. A lot's been done to understand the neuroscience of uh, top performance. And one of the things that was very interesting is the positron emission tomography scans. Those are the uh, scans that look at the metabolism in our body in various areas. So this is a positron emission tomography scan of the brain. This is the forward part of the brain. There's the back, there's the base. And what you see when people are feeling uh, fearful, like they don't have the resources, they don't have the time, they don't have the support that they need, it really fires up the amygdala. And that's the uh, fight, flight, or freeze part of our brain that shoots the adrenaline down and gets us all fired up. Um, uh, and you know that's effective when we're trying to fight off tigers or other things that our ancestors were dealing with, but it's not effective in, in today's environment where we have complex issues or like around our talent where we have to think in creative ways about how to put our talent into better use. Because what happens and what we've learned from these scans is what occurs with the rest of the brain. Uh, the prefrontal cortex, when we're in that fearful state, shuts down. That's our executive function that gives uh, attention to particular areas. So we lose kind of like our command control uh, part of our brain. We also uh, lose the effectiveness of the cerebral lobes, the part of our brain, parts of our brain that do our creative thinking and come up with new options and approaches. So the challenge that we have as humans in, in the 21st century is how do we overcome uh, the uh, challenges that we face uh, when we're trying to make better use of our talent, but our brains are, are really um, uh, going into that fearful protective mode that's denying us our best thinking. So we're gonna take a look at, at what it takes uh, to do that. Uh, before we do, I want to uh, bring up another polling question here, if you would, Joe, about, and you can click all of these that apply for you um, on this uh, screen here. There are actually sort of 10 different areas that we work on in Take Charge of Your Talent. These are five uh, principal ones. I'd like to know from you what you're looking for now, because that's going to help as we illustrate this in the remainder of the program. So take a, take a look at that. Um, so we're getting some comments that are coming in and I see that some people have taken um, a, a break from their work and are uh, querying how to use MIT Career Services. Joe, maybe you could just give a, a, a five, 10 second uh, link uh, to where people can go to type, you know, to get in that uh, sure. help we're, and support. We're at alum.mit edu slash careers. Okay. And so people can go right there and find out how to get help and support. This is somebody who's mm -hmm. taken off time to take, raise their kids and wants to get back in the game. Um, and, you know, are there any particular people that you'd recommend they connect with or there's a set of resources there and the right people will get back to the we folks at Query? We actually have a list of uh, career coaches that we work with and uh, some of whom offer discounts to MIT alumni. Uh, it's uh, all at alum.mit.edu slash careers. You can read more. Okay. And we're going to be talking a little bit later in this webinar about how you can go about expanding and, uh, and accessing the resources that you need for your career. So let's see how it turned out for uh, what people are looking for now. There we go. Okay. They want to make better use of their talent, uh, identify resources, build uh, their talent assets to get what they want, to gain more satisfaction with their talent. So lots of things that are exactly on point with what we're gonna be doing in today's session. So let, let's, let's jump in and, and take a look at what you can do to accomplish those results for yourself. So Take Charge of Your Talent is an effort to bring that neuroscience insight to the psychology of top performance and decades of career coaching into a package that people can use and apply. And you're going to be sampling those today. It's a little bit like this is going to this is lunch. So it's going to be a little bit like uh, tapas, you know, where you have little plates, little tastes uh, of this. And there's three uh, keys and you're going to sample each of those and see illustrations of them, in fact, with a fellow alum. Um, the first is to power up your talent story. How do you get it into that positive, hopeful frame of mind 
that's going to enable you to move forward. Because one of the things that we found is that many times the story that we're in is actually one that uh, our friends and colleagues in an empathetic way actually keep us stuck in our story. You know, they might say, oh, geez, you know, I know it must be so difficult. You're trying to balance so many things. Gosh, you know, you're, you're lucky to have the job you've got and to be in the situation that you're in. Well, it's very commiserating of them. But do you think, I think you can see how that actually reinforces the story and the chapter that they're in rather than freeing them to get beyond that. So we're going to talk about how you can power up your talent story, how you can shift that to actually make it uh, better and more effective. The second thing we're going to do is to talk about how to accelerate through obstacles. My experience as an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley is that actually obstacles uh, can be stepping stones, can be spring, indeed springboards for us to go in, into new directions and to do so more effectively. And we're going to talk about the specific ways in which you can do that. And then the third is how do you multiply the payoffs for yourself and others? How do you make this not only something that's going to work well for you, but work well in your organization and with the people that you work with or the people that you care about so that they're enlisted to want to support you because they see something in this for themselves as well as something in it for you. Um, so those are the three keys and we'll, we'll discuss uh, how you can put them into practice. Just to give you a framework, um, there's lots of uh, experience uh, with different organizations. These are a sampling of for-profit, not-for-profit, local governments and others that uh, this process has worked very effectively in. So you can use it uh, in any of those different environments and we'll talk about some different ways that that can be applied. What's been interesting to me is, and I know you're MIT folks, so you like data. So we actually have some data of doing whole teams on this. So you can do this as individuals with somebody else uh, being a talent catalyst for you, or you can do it as a whole team working together. This is a case of Accenture uh, when they did this with a team across the world, around the world and different uh, functional specialties. They found a 20% increase uh, in the use of talent, uh, some as much as 67% uh, and 13% uh, increase in the team satisfaction and some as much as 100% increase in their satisfaction level. And this is very important to us because this really validates, you know, that you can use more of your talent and be more satisfied. It isn't like one comes at the expense of the other, and that's critically important. If we were working together, we would be using um, the uh, participant guide here to go through it. I'm just gonna use some samples from it to do it. Uh, all the materials also in the book so that you can find it there. Uh, and I'll be sharing with you some things I'll be offering free to you at the end so that you can just send in an email to me and, and get what you'd like uh, to help you move forward. So let's talk about powering up your talent story. Uh, one of the things that I have found critically important in this, is, especially with folks like MIT alumni, whom, for whom I have lots of respect, is that you have uh, the curse of the gifted, as I call it. Uh, that is, uh, you're highly intelligent and uh, you can do lots of things. Uh, so one of the challenges in that is to figure out, well, what is it that you really want to do? Because I found for myself, you know, I can do lots of things. And when people ask me to do them, I'm often inclined to say, sure, yeah, I can do that. I can, you know, uh, work on that. I can help you do that. We can start up a company. We can do whatever. Uh, but at the end of the day, the real issue is, do I have the passion around that's going to sustain and help uh, drive success for the long term? That's what's really critically important. And so what uh, is essential in this is to figure out, you know, how you can ground what you want in, in yourself and have that be the springboard from which uh, you're moving forward. So let's look back uh, to the neuroscience here and see what else we can glean from neuroscience to help us figure out how to do that effectively. Uh, here's uh, a different image of the brain. This is an image, uh, image of the brain when people are in a hopeful state. So if you had the fearful state and you, we saw the shortcomings of that, it's very good if you're in survival mode, but not good if you're in wanting to be in growth mode. Uh, but hopes uh, stimulate our best thinking. And this is a, a positron emission tomography scan 
of a situation where someone's in a hopeful or positive state of mind. And what we see here is the amygdala, the before was all fired up in red, that means highly and overactivated here. It's in green, which means it's neither overactivated nor underactivated, it's just in balance. But the areas that are highly activated are the ones that we really want to be tapping, and that's the, the, uh, uh, the prefrontal uh, cortex here and the cerebral lobes. So if we can get ourselves into this frame of thinking, our brains will work for us in a very, very powerful and compelling way. And that's what I want to guide you on. And what we're going to be illustrating here with a, a, an alum from MIT, a volunteer that was identified through the registration process. So we haven't rehearsed this uh, because I wanted you to feel, uh, have a real life experience of how this could work. Um, so let's take, uh, let's introduce our, um, our guest here, Isaac. Uh, Isaac, if you join us on the video and with your audio, great. Welcome, Isaac. Um, so Isaac, if you would just uh, take a moment as uh, we begin to have a talent catalyst conversation, as we call it here, just give our audience a, a thumbnail sketch about yourself so they know where you're coming from. Yeah, definitely. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, good to be here. I, uh, I'm a recent MIT alum, so I graduated in 2016. Um, and I work at a startup now here in Boston in the civic technology space. Um, and then also on this side, I'm uh, involved in local government. Uh, so I'm a kind of, uh, I'm an elected town meeting member in Brookline. So that means I'm part of the legislature that gets to vote on zoning, the budget, uh, things like that, uh, which I do in addition to my, uh, my day job at a startup. So. Okay, super. Great. So um, Isaac's a great example of somebody who's really bridging multiple sectors here, the private sector, public sector, uh, and personal interests. So let, let's take a look at what can be helpful here in uh, moving forward. So we're going to uh, begin uh, here with the very first steps in what a talent catalyst conversation is. So a talent catalyst conversation, again, if you remember your chemistry, as I imagine most of you do, um, a catalyst is uh, something that stimulates a reaction, precipitates a result, accelerates um, a, a reaction, but doesn't get used up in the process. And that means they don't become one of the reagents, but they actually stimulate something that's very powerful. So I'm gonna be serving as a talent catalyst for Isaac. Uh, in that kind of role by asking him some questions that will elicit his thinking. Um, so uh, let's go to the first one here about what your hopes are. Uh, Isaac, what are your hopes for your talent at this stage? I think at this stage, I want to I want to be good at identifying talents that I have and also recognizing things that I hope will be future talents and developing those uh, if they aren't talents yet. Okay, so so you're. Can you tell us a little bit about why those hopes are important to you? Yeah, um, I think that in the long so in the long run for me, I care about um, kind of public impact in my career, and I recognize that um, there are a lot of there are a lot of aspects and talents that might go into a career, especially one that kind of bridges the public sector and the private sector. Um, that you need to you need to wear a lot of different hats, and you need to uh, be very mindful of the situation and role that you're occupying at any given point in time. Okay, so what I'm hearing from you is, and this is part of the the uh, talent of a uh, talent catalyst, is to reflect back what's being heard because it's very helpful for people to uh, have a mirror on their thinking. A lot of people talk to figure out what they think, especially on something that they're trying to evolve or change. So if we serve as a talent catalyst to somebody by reflecting back, that's the very, very first and most powerful thing for a talent catalyst to do. So let me check in with you, Isaac. What I'm hearing from you is that you're wanting to test out your talents, figure out how they can apply uh, to help make a, a difference in, in an effective way in how uh, local governments and communities and other organizations function. And you're, you're looking for what's that connection between your talent, uh, the private sector, and that, um, a per that local government public purpose uh, th that's going to work for you. Yeah, exactly. So um, there might be there might be aspects of uh, so, for instance, there might be aspects of 
kind of my volunteer work with local government that I find that I'm really good at. And okay, let's figure out a way that I can incorporate some of those skills or talents um, into my career in some way and vice versa. So having, having kind of each of those hats that I wear inform the other. Okay, so you're trying to find something that's going to help integrate these different components of things that are valuable and important to you. Yeah. Okay. All right, great. So that's an illustration of this is just the first question in 10 questions that uh, we invite people to explore or, uh, in a Talent Catalyst conversation. Um, so if we proceeded, you could within an hour, actually, it typically is 45 minutes to an hour, uh, you could actually go from what their hopes are, which uh, Isaac was starting to uh, explore and, and explain. Uh, into, you know, what are some of the opportunities you'd like to pursue as well as the obstacles you're confronting and then some actions. What we've done is we found it's very critical to avoid that situation where we're really uh, having um, empathy overcome effective brain uh, work to actually script out those 10 questions. And if you're interested in what the remaining questions are and how you could use them and you wanna find somebody who would have such a conversation like this with you, I'll just give you the email address at the end. You can send me and I'll send you one, uh, send you the two pages of the 10 questions and spaces to fill them in your answers um, in a complimentary basis via email. So what we found is, is that these conversations yield results in very powerful ways. Uh, that uh, they're useful for everybody because somebody's actually listening to them and connecting with them and hearing them. And that in 10% uh, of the cases, uh, people actually find breakthroughs by having new insights, new perspectives on how they could go forward uh, in their careers in the context of the uh, one hour conversation itself. So you can be a very powerful catalyst for other people. People can be very powerful catalysts for you. Uh, and I encourage you to think about that sort of role. So it's a little different than being like a career counselor or somebody else or being a manager, you know, that has a stake in where you're going and therefore is a reagent in your thinking process, you know, because they're trying to push you someplace or maybe even a spouse or partner, you know, they're trying to get you to do something. Uh, this talent catalyst role is a very powerful one because it, it's there to stimulate these ideas and to get results uh, coming forward. So let's move on to the second one here about how to accelerate through obstacles and in particular, how to kick some butts out of the way uh, that really uh, prompt uh, us to get into uh, challenging situations. So I'm wondering, uh, whoops, and it's sort of taking off on its own here. I think maybe uh, it was set to do auto speed here, uh, Joe. So I don't know if there's a way we can uh, adjust that back, but um, I just I just see the polling question. You just see the polling question. Oh, you have on to take slide. the polling question off on your end. Okay, yeah. Uh, are you uh, ready for the third poll? Are you saying? Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, have you been seeing the slides here as we've been going along? Yes, I have. Yes. Okay, great. Good. Yep. I wanted to be sure that that was working. Yep. Okay. So we're going to take a moment here uh, just before you launch the poll. Well, go ahead. Launch the Sorry. poll. That's fine. <laughs> um, uh, we're looking at what obstacles people face. What we've actually found in our research is that there are 15 obstacles that uh, are the ones that most frequently arise for people. I'm a, I've identified three of them here so we can dive in and take a look at them um, in some more detail. Uh, but what we've uh, done is is provide a diagnostic. So if you have a particular obstacle you're facing for each of the 15 obstacles, there's a tool that's been proven effective in responding to that obstacle and helping you move forward. So we'll take a look at those and see what can come forward. Um, you know, I'm seeing some of the questions that are coming in that I think are related to these obstacles, like, okay, I've got a high paid job full of benefits but not too much satisfaction. Uh, you know, uh, when do I know that it, uh, when it is a good time to leave for something else? That's a critical one. An obstacle can be, yeah, we have golden handcuffs uh, that are keeping us in where we are. Uh, as entrepreneurs or as in career changers, we need to think about how do we, how can we live at a lean level that gives us the flexibility to move? We'll talk a little bit about how you can get some of the resources and how you can assess that. I would suggest in that situation, you try the rest of the Talent Catalyst conversation questions. Uh, that'll really help you focus that. 
um, and can take a look at um, where we can go with it. So let's, Joe, let's take a look at uh, which obstacles are, are uh, looming most large. Okay, asking for what I want from others, okay, and not enough time to develop my talent and I don't have the resources I need. I'm, I'm curious in your situation, Isaac, which one did you pick of those three as, as uh, or maybe you picked multiple ones, but wh which one was most relevant to you? Um, I think having, I, th I think asking what I want from others is uh, definitely, definitely something that I uh, spend a lot of time thinking about. Okay, so since there was also a lot of interest in some of the other topics, uh, I'll just take a brief time to talk about A and B, you know, what, how to get the time you need and how to get the resources that you need. That also answers some of the questions here about how to get your uh, talent lined up with what uh, you need to move it forward. Uh, but then we'll zero in in an actual example with you, Isaac, on asking for what you want from others. So if you think of something that you'd be willing to share uh, as something you'd like to ask for. We'll try to make it a little bit concrete because I find when people see a concrete illustration through somebody like yourself, it really helps them see uh, something that they could be doing with their own question or their own circumstance. But let, let's go on and while you're pondering that a bit, we'll take a look at some of these other, um, uh, other issues. So one of the key things about getting your butt out of the way is, you know, I hope to, uh, so what I, you know, that's what you're seeking to accomplish, but and that's our protective part of our brain coming in because our, our fearful brain always comes in to override our hopeful brain. So when we have a hope, one of the first things our brain will do unless we reprogram it and sort of like overriding the set um, uh, presets on a piece of software. If we don't override that, the buts will come in and people will say, oh yeah, I hope to do that, but you know, here's, here are all the problems. Um, and what we need to do is figure out how do we get the butt out of the way to instead say, okay, how fascinating. And now I have the opportunity to figure out how to uh, accomplish what I want. So if we were to apply that in, in the case that Isaac uh, share with us, you know, it'd be something like, I hope to find a way to bring these different areas of interest of mine in the public sector and private sector together. But, you know, I've got to, I got to get people to line up with me and I've got to get people to provide resources and support. Um, so instead of the but, you'd say how fascinating. So I will hope to get uh, this opportunity moving forward. And now, uh, this creates a situation where I can figure out how to have both, how to get these things that I want to marry together and to come together and uh, be able to do that with and through other people uh, to be effective. So you see that's, that's a critical shift in our thinking because it shifts how our brain works if we move from the but to an and. That's also some, if some of you have done improvisational thinking uh, and work, you, you've probably seen, you know, that's a key thing. Every time that you go to an improv, the thing they always do, no matter how, you know, juxtaposed two things are, they'll always say, okay, that and, and then they'll work with it. Uh, that's what I want for you is I want you to have the kind of improvisational skills that are going to enable you to agilely move through your career and figure out how you can go forward in an effective way. So let's talk about how you shift the buts to ands and to do that with a couple of these areas and then zero in on Isaac's case. So if you don't have enough time and opportunity to get done what you want, I invite you to think about a surgeon's schedule. Uh, surgeons are very effective in how they go about using their day. They figure out the most productive time of their day uh, and they have their surgeries then. They exclude everything else. They even turn off their cell phones. That's a huge move for many of us, you know, uh, during the workday. Uh, and they have office hours separate because, and they have to do that because if uh, they didn't, uh, you know, off, people coming in during office hours, during surgeries, uh, it would be messy and people's lives would be at risk. Well, I'd like you to think about your career and the development of your talent with the same kind of dedication and passion that surgeons have. Because while you may not be dealing with a physical life or death issue at any particular point of time, you are dealing with the life or death of your talent and what's done with your talent. Um, and so here's a way that you can put a surgeon's practice into work for you. 
So the first thing is identify what is your most productive time of the day or week. So if I'm, I invite you, if you're sitting out there, jot down what that is. You know, most of you know what that is. Some of you are morning people, night people, day of the week, whatever. Um, then commit that you're going to block out some times for your most important projects, including what you're doing to develop your talent, because that's really the time that you're um, developing your skills, your abilities, honing your saw, if you will, uh, to be successful. And that's equally important as how much you produce uh, with the uh, saw that may have gotten dull because you haven't given it given time to sharpening it. Um, then you have to set up a system to handle other demands during that time. So surgeons don't just say, okay, I'm, you know, I'm not going to respond to anybody. They, they, uh, during their surgeries, they get their office staff to take an, um, uh, messages, to set up schedules, to do things. So they've set up a system so that that can work. Um, and then they train others to honor the schedule. So people know what that is. Okay. On Tuesday mornings at, you know, uh, 9 AM to 11, I'm working on a major project and you block out other things so that, that works. You don't do email first, you don't do whatever that's gonna distract you, you get it working for yourself. And you, if you sustain that practice for three weeks, and actually the, the experience shows, and I've done this with CEOs of corporations as well as uh, up and comers, if you do it for just one week and you have one surgery session for yourself where you're really giving attention to the highest and most important use of your talent for yourself, um, you will find that your satisfaction will soar. And if you do it for three weeks, it'll, it, you'll, you'll get hooked. Because uh, when you feed your brain in that way with such satisfaction, it's like you're firing up the dopamine that makes it's essentially the drug, or the natural drug in ourselves that gets us to keep doing things in an effective way. And you'll enjoy the results. So that's one thought about time. If you expand your resources, the amazing thing to uh, our research is how little people use the resources they have. Um, so if you take the, if you have a target, like Joe has a target of wanting to work in this space and to introduce these ideas and to get his uh, project and products out there and accepted, you know, if he were, and, and you on your topic were to write down a hundred uh, list of resources that you have, people, places, things that you could tap to help that go, our experience is that by the time you get that list to a hundred, you will have accomplished your result because you will be so resourceful, so aware of the resources you have that you'll go forward and use them. Now, the other component here is that a lot of people use a lot less of the resources than they have. So when Isaac's thinking about asking uh, people for um, support in, in what he wants to do, um, you know, maybe he's asking hasn't asked somebody, that would be sort of zero use of that resource, or has asked them but made a small ask, he could make a bigger one. Um, so there's some actions then that you can take to figure out, okay, how could you increase resource usage and what would be some ways to do that? So lots of opportunities there. The other thing that I have a lot of fun with uh, and I really enjoy are mashups. You know, mashups are the, are the uh, coin of the realm in Silicon Valley or the, uh, a 128 a corridor or whichever area, the, the research triangle, wherever you are, um, because the, everyone's discovered that, hey, why start something from scratch when we already have pieces out there? And the same thing applies to our careers. Why start from scratch when we've got resources, might be a people, might be places, might be things, and we, what are new ways we can combine them? And you can do a creative exercise around that, which is a lot of fun. So a lot of ways that you can go forward. But let's zero in and come back to Isaac here on how to make an effective uh, request. So let's talk about the components of this. The first is to have a clear intention, the what and the why of it for you and what's the value to the other person. How do you create a bridge between you and the person that you're asking uh, to co go forward and, and uh, work with you on something or provide some support? Uh, the second is to provide an observation, some factual, non-judgmental statement um, so that you're just explaining why that's important, uh, but in a factual way. Sometimes we're so frustrated in asking for something that we want, like from a spouse, a partner, or a recalcitrant teenage uh, child uh, of ours, that, you know, we, we just launch into... Uh, we're so frustrated, we're over the top, we just blurt out, I just want, need you to do X. 
and we forget about the intention. We, we get angry about what they've done or haven't done. It becomes a judgmental thing, and that gets in the way of getting a result. And then the request needs to be a simple direct statement, uh, and then you just go quiet and let them respond. And you provide a confirmation or a restatement. So you're clear that you have a meeting of the minds on this. So let's just try a quick example of this with Isaac. Isaac, do you have a request that you're thinking of and want to play with this model for a moment? Uh, what I suggest that you do out there when you actually go forward with this is to do what, in fact, Isaac and I are doing. Practice your request. If it's an important request, practice the request with somebody else. Ask them, hey, did, did this engage me? Uh, was it, did I feel judged when you asked me this or did I feel open and invited? Was your request clear? You know, and did we come up with a clear agreement out of it? So practice uh, these things and make them work. And that's what Isaac and I are going to do here so you can see the value of that. So Isaac, what's a request you'd like to make? Sure. Um, can you tee it up? Who would it, yeah. you know, kind of the type of person, type of situation? Definitely. So the kind of context behind this is that um, I collaborate with, uh, I'll, I won't use a job example here. I'll use a kind of town meeting example. I okay. collaborate with other town meeting members on warrant articles, which are kind of equivalent of bills. Um, but this could totally work for a similar situation, mm -hmm. um, and kind of communication scenario, uh, in my day job. And I think that communication isn't quite where it needs to be. Um, okay. and so if I was going to kind of phrase this as an ask, um, I want to say, Hey, I, um, I'd probably start with the observation, which is that I've let been, me, let me just do this. If I could interject as a talent. Yeah, jump in. Uh, I'd like to encourage you to start with the intention. Okay. It's very hard for people to know what to do with the information we give them if they don't know where we're going with it. And if they mm -hmm. don't know what's in it for them to even start listening. So uh, you may have a much superior way to do this, but I'd like the audience to have the benefit of how this works. So if you could express an intention, so you can say to somebody, okay, so-and-so, I would like thus and such, and what's the bridge to their interest? I want us to have a great working relationship so that our priorities can be passed by town meeting. Okay. All right. Um, let's go on to the observation. So how would you express your observation in a way that wouldn't make them feel wrong about whatever is happening currently, but yet in, invited to see the data that would help them go forward? Yeah, I think that when we've worked together in the past, um, while we've gotten done what we've wanted to get done, there have been uh, there have been some tasks that we've both done when one of us could have done it and occasionally tasks that uh, got done in time, but just barely and in a more stressful environment than it needed to be. Um, and a couple things that weren't uh, mission critical, but did slip through the cracks. Okay. All right. Good. Non-judgmental, data-driven, uh, specific examples. Excellent. So what would be your request? My request would be that we just maintain one line of communication instead of using calls, texts, emails, slacks to keep track of all of our different tasks that we have. Let's pick one and use it and let's have a clear cut list with assignments so that um, we each know what, uh, what each of us has taken on for responsibilities and also what none of us has necessarily chosen yet. Okay. All right, very clear, very direct request. You just go quiet. Uh, we have a tendency to wanna to keep selling our position. Uh, the best, most important thing at this juncture is, is to hear what they have to say. Uh, and then um, uh, they would respond and you'd have, they'd say, okay, I think I could work. I'd, how about if we use X uh, as our tool? Uh, and then you would have the role of restating. Uh, but the important thing is, okay, then what's the action? All right. So it would be like, OK, if we're going to use agree to use email and have a master list, uh, you know, uh, are we agreed that we'll start that at our next meeting or whatever the situation is? So you need the confirmation. Otherwise, you could have 
yeah, I think this is, you know, what Isaac's saying makes sense. I see the situation. I understand his request. But you could go off with two very different notions of what you agreed to and how that might get implemented. Okay, so that's the simple formula here for getting uh, results that you want. Um, and I found it's effective with uh, the CEOs have used it. I found, you know, actually the higher you go, the more you're having to make requests of other people. You know, even the president of the United States, maybe with the current uh, occupant uh, as an exception, you know, they're always having to ask people to do things because they can't accomplish really anything at the scope that they're working on without other people being enlisted. So this is something that can work with you and, and will work with you and you'll need it even more the further you go in your career. So let, let's take a look at um, moving on here and uh, discussing some of the other elements here. But the whole key of this is how can you make obstacles into opportunities? How, you know, the fun of skiing is going down the moguls, having the challenges. So we're not trying to find a career in which we have no challenges, no obstacles, but rather we're trying to find ways in which those obstacles can stimulate positive uh, results. Just like Isaac example of, hey, we've got all these different ways and different priorities and different ways of communicating them and it's sort of chaotic. That obstacle to accomplishing what he wants to do for his community actually is stimulated his thinking about a suggestion and a solution. So the obstacle was good. If you didn't have the obstacle, you maybe you never would have gotten to that opportunity and that idea. And I hope that you'll look at that in a similar way so that you'll think about, okay, I have an obstacle and how can I accomplish what I want dealing with the circumstances that I have and what are the ways uh, that we can go about doing that? So we're, we're gonna move on here to the third key uh, and give you a little top, a little sample, a little appetizer of this. And that is how to uh, multiply the payoffs for yourself and others. Um, and what we're looking at here is, you know, it's one thing to have these ideas, but we need to translate them into uh, concrete a tangible results. Uh, and that's really where the payoff is. Now, there's a very effective uh, equation for this. thought MIT alumni would like equations. Uh, for talent, there's an equation for getting what you want. You solve this equation and you get what you want. So let me show you what the equation is. First, we start off with the objective function, opportunities you want. Let me say, okay, what are the elements that are going to get you the opportunities that you want? Well, the first is to have a brand, or that is a promise that creates a preference for you. That's the classic definition of a brand uh, that's used for products, but there's every reason to use it for yourself and for your career. So your brand is a promise that creates a preference for you. What is it about what you do, how you do it, uh, et cetera, that is going to be creating a link between what you want and how you present yourself. Because unless the universe knows what you want and why it's important to you uh, and what you can offer in addressing it, it's not going to respond by giving you opportunities. People aren't gonna know what it is that you're after and why and how to deal with it. So, um, but you have to have proof of that brand. And there is not enough to say, okay, here's, here's, this is uh, who I am and what I do and what's valuable. Uh, you've got to show some proof points. These are some tangible assets. You've got to make it concrete. Uh, and I know a lot of you had that as an objective is how do you create some tangible assets that are going to be credible to get you the opportunities that you want? So we're going to work through this, this particular equation. We're going to come uh, to it in just a moment here. Um, and uh, see what we can do to help you get there for yourself. This is an example here of uh, one person uh, that was doing this. She was a development person at a university. Uh, so she's out getting money, getting donors, getting people excited about it, but she really wanted to be doing more. Um, and so, but she realized she had a brand that was old, you know, and everyone said, oh yeah, she's the, she's the fundraiser person. She, you know, but she wanted to really be helping solve some core issues in the organization and with the community. So she developed a brand of being a kick-ass problem solver, you know, bringing opportunities and resources together for success. And then she figured out, okay, what were the ways she was going to provide some proof points that she had the chops, if you will, to deliver that. 
And so that was, you know, her way of starting out about it. And I invite you each to write on a sheet of paper what your brand is that you think would help you get the opportunities you want. And then we're going to talk with um, Isaac's example here about how do you uh, turn that into some tangibles. Because it's not enough to have ideas, it's not enough to have a brand. You've got to make it uh, concrete. You know, it's not enough to say, hey, I got a rabbit in the hat. You got to pull the rabbit out of the hat. You got to show that there's a real rabbit there. So while uh, Isaac is thinking about where he is on his talent equation here, uh, let's take a let's offer uh, a polling question um, on what needs attention. And if you'd put that poll up for us, please. And while that poll's going on, I'm going to seek to go to some of the um, so, so click as many of the items on this uh, poll as you think need attention for yourself. And we'll then give a little focus on that when how we discuss it with Isaac. Um, so people are asking, you know, like they've got uh, children that are stuck in their life, deathly afraid of failure. Yep. And uh, if they're afraid of failure, they're paralyzed. Uh, yep. I can understand that. You can see that from the brain scans. Um, you know, I think a critical thing to do in a situation like that, anyone who's in that situation, a colleague, a friend, a spouse, a partner, uh, who, uh, whomever, is to really uh, find somebody that they are comfortable talking with who can have a conversation with them that starts to getting them talking about their hopes. Um, and uh, one of the things that will help you in that is then really getting effective results. So let's take a look. So clarity about desired opportunities. Yeah, boy, that's huge. Um, if you're not clear about what you want, then it's going to be hard to solve your equation. Um, and I would say from my own experience, um, it's an iterative process. Oftentimes I've had a, an idea. In fact, one of the things that I found useful uh, is to, if I'm looking at getting into a new industry or in a new role or a new uh, kind of situation, I'll do some research about it and I'll think, hey, I think this industry or this uh, business or this community would really benefit from dealing with the following issue or opportunity. So I come up with something and then I think about, okay, how could that come forward? Uh, and oftentimes when I end up discussing it with people, people say, well, you know, I understand what you're talking about. It sounds interesting, but actually uh, we're more interested in this other item, um, you know, what do you think about it? So actually, if you work this equation, it will get you to where you want to go. So let's let's uh, jump in here. And um, Isaac, can you, uh, let's start off with an opportunity that you'd like. So can you, is there something you'd like to highlight? Yeah, I think I would like to, so kind of internally at my company, I definitely like to be making, um, or at least in the room for a lot of the strategic decisions that we make about um, kind of what what market niches to pursue and also mechanically how we're going to go after those. Okay. So you'd like to be at the table and be able to offer, you know, hear the input from others and to be able to provide your ideas and expertise. Yeah. Okay. So what kind of brand uh, do you think you need to offer to attract an opportunity to do that? How would people need to think of Isaac? And how would you like to be thought of in a distinctive way um, that would enable you to attract an opportunity like that? What's special about you and how does that speak to attracting the opportunity? Yeah, I think that, um, so you, you mentioned being a problem solver, but ultimately I think that's kind of what it comes down to and having the ability to think strategically. So having, having a reputation of being insightful um, and knowledgeable about different markets would probably go a long way towards, uh, towards getting there. Okay. So just to uh, do a quick version of that, and this is another way in which a talent catalyst can be helpful to you is, is they can hear you and kind of say, oh, okay, what I'm hearing is this. And then they, you can say that's it or not. But I'm, I'm hearing that your brand, if I were to do a kind of a quick and dirty version here, is that you're in a, um, you're an insightful uh, problem solver um, who's able to take the pieces and figure out, you know, opportunities to move forward. 
that sounds lovely. <laughs> okay. Uh, so you can probably improve on that or whatever. Uh, do you think that's the way people uh, see you in the organization right now? If they, were to, um, if they were to ask, if we were to do a survey, and I, in fact, in the book, we offer people the idea of doing a brand audit. If you go, went around and asked people, uh, you know, how do you view me in the organization? What would be a few words that you would use? Well, uh, do you think those would be the words or would it be a little bit different from that? And so I'll I, talk with you in a moment about how you can switch. Yeah, I, I think that the words would be similar. Um, and I think the proof points would be slightly different. Uh huh. Okay. So, so that's, that's going to be key here. So how do you, what are the proof points, kinds of proof points that do you think would be uh, valuable, tangible, not just like I talk a good line, but like, here's something I've created. I've created a process for thinking through these issues, or I've created a, you know, uh, I've, I've got a case study that worked through this or something that you actually kind of have on the shelf, if you will, or and can pull off physically. Definitely. Or, or, so, or... There are several, um, there are several improvements to our operations setup and how we deploy uh, in the field, particularly at some of the, um, some of the larger events that we take care of as a business, um, as well as some core UI and UX improvements that um, exist because I noticed how we and our users approached those events and was able to bring those recommendations back to the team and figure out how, um, you know, how in a way those experiences could be improved without being a giant hassle for the product team to implement. Okay, that's great. So those are illustrations. One of the things that you could do to make them even more tangible is uh, you could, because a tangible asset is one that others can use and apply. So it's not just like, hey, Isaac does this, but what Isaac has done is now translated into something that other people can do in a similar way or apply to another circumstance. So what you do in that, in that situation to make your, what you've got a tangible asset, because you'll get the most recognition when you create things that not only work for you and you have enabled you to s contribute successfully, but enable other people to contribute because then they'll want to advance you because, okay, Isaac's got tools that other people can use. We're going to give Isaac new things to do uh, because he's now, you know, covered these other things for other people. So those would be the kinds of things that you'd look at and you'd work through in this. Uh, just a simple example here of how this would work. Um, you know, Google, uh, is a place where everybody's a learner and a teacher. So their idea is everybody's got something that they can learn, something they can teach, uh, and that's something that you can make concrete uh, for one another. And that's, what's going to help you be successful in, in doing this. So let me just cover a few resources for you. And then I want to cover some final questions here that have come in and see what I can do to be helpful. Um, and if I have, a, don't have the time to be helpful to you and you'd like to send me an email, um, I would be glad to respond to you. Um, but if you'd like to get, for example, a complimentary outline for the Talent Catalyst conversation or the 10 questions uh, that you can ask somebody in an hour's time to help shift their thinking in a constructive and productive way, uh, obviously that's in the book, Take Charge of Your Talent. But if you'd like to just get a complimentary two-page version of that, uh, you just send me an email, I'll be glad to send it to you. You could read the book. It has lots of resources. It has the tools for f uh, the 15 different obstacles and how to overcome them, the kinds of things that we were talking about today. Uh, and you can check out my blog on you know, what, what some of the latest thinking uh, on this topic. So I want to go to a final polling question. And while that's up, uh, get um, uh, some of these other questions that will be valuable to multiple people here answered. So if you put that one up, Joe, uh, the whole thing with, with coaching, with being a catalyst for other people is, okay, at the end of the end of this session, what do you want to do? What are you going to do to make a difference for yourself and click off as many as are relevant to you? Um, and let's see, uh, what would be uh, some of the topics here? So somebody is asking about, I have a small business in the healthcare field and I have good ideas to grow it, but I don't have the business experience to do it. How can I get experience or help to do that? Yeah, um, that's really thinking about the resources. What are the people, places, and things that can help accelerate you? And rather, if, if you know, the healthcare field's moving so fast, 
it's not a, a self-learned environment anymore. Uh, I would say you'd want to figure out how you could ask people that are very knowledgeable to engage with you around that, use that making effective requests uh, technique to go about doing it, uh, and you'd um, be effective. Uh, some people are asking, since many of you are in the um, capstone or, or um, you know, repositioning place in your career, uh, this person's in a company that sees uh, 40 as done. Is it possible to stay and still find more satisfaction by talents? Is the culture one that means it's time to leave? Well, you know, that's, that's really uh, gets to that branding question. Got to think about, well, what are the opportunities you want in that company? And then what's the brand you're going to need to be seen as relevant? You may be branded as not relevant because your ideas are old or perceived as being old. So you need some new, a new brand and you need a new set of proof points that of how you are relevant and what you can contribute. So a lot of these tools that we've been talking about can help you apply to that. Um, how do you know that your hopes are realistic and achievable? The key thing that I found in this is to be asking your, is to have a talent catalyst really probe with you. And you saw that I did this at several levels with Isaac. Ask not only, well, why is that hope important to you? Uh, but then why is that important to you? If you get people to really go deeper and deeper about what's, uh, what their hopes are and why they're important to them, they get to a bedrock that really is solid and foundational. A lot of times we have um, expectations of ourselves, like, okay, an MIT alum out 20 years ought to be doing or having the following kinds of opportunities. But those aren't your hopes. Those are expectations you have of yourself. Uh, or things that you think you should do to be successful. If you get somebody asking you, and this is where the value is of someone asking you, it gets you beyond this kind of set patterns of thinking that you have. So there's a bunch of other things here, and I would love to respond to more of them. Um, I hope that our the time we've taken in illustrating these points with Isaac has been helpful for you in thinking about how to solve some of these things yourself. And I, I welcome each and every one of you to send me an email about anything that you'd like to ask and uh, I'll be glad to respond. So let's take a look at the polling results here. Build a brand and proof points for success. That really resonated. Yep, uh, uh, that's the sort of capstone and take charge of your talent, but it's very important before you jump into that, that you have, you power up your talent story, that you're thinking about what you're hoping to accomplish so that you know you're on a solid foundation for where you want to go. If you just sort of grab, oh, I want this opportunity and I, I'm going to brand myself this way to get it, it may not have the authenticity, the passion, the commitment, and you may be c condemned to the curse of the gifted. Um, I want you to get that strong foundation with that talent catalyst conversation, and that'll be helpful for you in moving forward. Uh, engage my hopeful mind to power me. That's good. There are lots of good tools for, and ways to do that. Um, and uh, obstacles as stepping stones. Yep, those are all key. So lots of things that I'm seeing that you're looking for here, and I'm thankful for everyone's attention today and focus on this. Uh, and, and thank you, Isaac, for stepping forward to be, uh, as my little nephew would say, a diggy big. He had trouble with his consonants, so diggy big is a guinea pig. But uh, I, I think you've been very useful in being with us today and helping to illustrate these points. And I hope you got something for yourself out of it. Definitely. Thank you. Okay. And uh, Joe, uh, some uh, closing thoughts. Thank you, Don, and thanks for, for all the wisdom today, uh, and special thanks to Isaac for volunteering. Uh, and thanks to you, our alumni viewers, for tuning in and participating. Uh, today's presentation will be on the Alumni Association YouTube channel within a week. Please check there for it. Uh, and a link to Don's slides will be available uh, within 24 hours. We'll send that to all registrants. Uh, if you have questions or comments, I'm sorry we didn't get to everybody's questions today. Dom will certainly look at them. Um, please feel free to contact him. If you have questions about the webinar, uh, feel free to email careers at mit.edu. And Don, thanks again. Well, thank you all. And go forth and have fun making the most of your talent and enjoying doing it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.